face the final frontier. Science fiction is basically saying there are no limits. Space is anything we want it to be. Yes! The scale of the universe is unbelievably stunning. We are asking those big questions like, where are we going? And what does it say about us as humans? I think it answers something elemental in human beings, which is we love danger. Ah! Ah! My space travel sounds rather perilous. They will never get me onto one of those dreadful starships. Science fiction inspired the rocketeers who brought us to the moon. And that's just the beginning. Ah! Science fiction holds out hope for even more incredible discoveries. I think we're curious in our bones about going into the galaxy. What has the galaxy ever done for you? Why would you want to save it? Because I'm one of the idiots who lives in it. Humanity is hardwired to explore and to exploit. We are citizens of the universe. We belong there, too. I've been thinking about this idea that space is anything we want it to be. It's the great unknown, and we can project our fantasies and our ideas, our sociology, and you know we can use it just as an excuse to get to a completely different culture, or we can take it at face value as a problem we need to solve. Yeah. And I sort of think about science, space science fiction as, you know, on the one hand, you got the hard tech stuff like 2001, and then at the other end of the spectrum, it's more space as a kind of complete unfettering of the imagination. You got, you got two things. No matter how you do it, whether it's 2001 or Star Wars, they're adventures. The, the, the big boogeyman is the unknown. Right. Because the thing about humans, it's always been with us, is we have an imagination. The night sky has always been the great mystery. One, it's terrifying, because you walk out in it and you get eaten. And the other part is that there's, there's things up there. I mean, the stars, the planets, yeah. and the things have to mean something. So this is a primal attraction. Yes, what and you're man has curiosity. Curiosity and imagination bring you things like stories. So you're saying it's a mystical connection. There's a mystical connection with yep. the sky yep. and with stars and all things. So they relate directly to us. Isn't that what we try to do with our movies? Take capture yeah. a little bit of that awe and bring it into a movie theater and, and feel what it might be like to go out there? How small a human can be in front of the entire planet. And then the camera will spin around and you'll see how small a human is in front of the vastness of the universe. Can't beat the view. That movie really brought people to space. It showed them not only what the view looked like, but also what it felt like to have the view. And that was so important to me to be able to share because the view is unimaginable. It was so clean and pristine. It almost hurt your eyes because the edges are so sharp and it's giant. When I was living up on the space station, my little brother met Sandra Bullock's brother-in-law. He said, well, you know, my sister-in-law is making this movie. Maybe your sister would talk to her. And my little brother said, she's been up there for a couple months with five guys, and I think she'd love to talk to Sandra Bullock. How are you feeling? Like a chihuahua that's being tumble dried. Some of the things that she wanted to know were, what's it like for me when I wake up in the morning? What's a hard thing? What's an easy thing? So that she understands how she can make space look real. Sandra, I thought, looked purposeful and not like a newbie. Space travel has been a science fiction theme for a long, long, long time. It is really fantastic the lengths that the early science fiction writers went to to get a spacecraft 
from the earth even to the moon. George Melies was a, originally a stage magician who got enamored with the, the brand new art form of cinematography. And not only uh, did he invent the science fiction movie, he essentially invented movie special effects. And it was really based on the two giants of science fiction at the time, H.G. Wells and Jules Verne. Jules Verne provided the plot and story for the first half of the movie with his From the Earth to the Moon. The second half was based on H.G. Wells' First Men in the Moon. Early depictions of space travel show characters just moving about freely, opening up the door and walking out into space with no trouble. But within a couple decades, things change pretty quickly in cinematic depictions of uh, outer space and space travel. So as early as the 1920s, you have films like Woman in the Moon by Fritz Lang, where characters are strapped into their seats. And as the ship is taking off, they can feel the pressure of the G-force on their chest, struggling to breathe as they lift off. And then you've got writers that worked for John W. Campbell Jr. when he began editing Astounding Science Fiction who were held to a standard of scientific verisimilitude, and that's when you start getting realistic, believable space adventures. No time for count-off, stand by. Fire! Tell us about this trip to the moon. Do you, do you think this is possible? Oh, yes, yes, it's quite possible. We're here, aren't we? Not only yes. are we here, but uh, it can be done. It can be done as soon as anyone is willing to put the bill to do it. Robert Heinlein was the guru of hard science fiction, but I think before that, and beyond that, he was the guru of logical science fiction. Heinlein asked the question, which is the classic hard science fiction question, how do you do it? How do you solve that problem? Even today, that's a key theme in science fiction. The debris chain reaction is out of control. We're rapidly expanding. Multiple satellites are down and they keep on falling. The Quarons wanted to recreate the good, the bad, and the ugly of space travel can hit you with the kinetic energy of a howitzer round. The film Gravity is visually compelling because it really sets up the unforgiving dynamic, how just the smallest step in the wrong direction is going to send the entire series of events tumbling. And it only takes that much. No! The only really big mistake they made in the movie is that if you were up on a space station, the last thing you'd do is let George Clooney go. There's a lot of secrets in the universe. We don't know anything. That's the one thing I do know for sure. But we've got to get out of our solar system. We've got to get to another solar system. Yeah, but Einstein says you can't travel faster than the speed of light. Science fiction is basically saying there are no limits. I try. Think outside the box. No matter what somebody tells you, no matter right. what you've learned, throw all that away and say, I can do anything I want to do. You're in a completely different universe. Traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops, boy. We sometimes forget that space is cosmologically big. Traveling to the rest of the universe would take tens, thousands of years with current technology. The reason we measure them in light years is because it takes that long for the speed of light to travel that distance. Faster than light travel is the holy grail of space travel. And right now, it's the balonium that we, balonium is that stuff you make up to make the story work. And it's different from hand wavium, which is how you distract the, the reader or the viewer. But, uh, and it's not unobtainium, that's a different, but uh, balonium is that stuff. If we had the right balonium, we could make faster than light travel work. So here is a perfect limitation for an artist. You can't go faster than light speed. How are we gonna get around it to explore the universe? Science fiction writers said, okay, well, we have to create a speed faster than light speed. Are you ready to say goodbye to our solar system? Execute job. I'm not sure what's wrong here. Is the parking brake on? Compressor. With that rush, science fiction launches an age of exploration. We're down to point 3896 of light speed. Forbidden Planet is one of those rare, big budget science fiction movies from a time when most science fiction movies look pretty cheesy. 
it's very easy to see many of the things that later science fiction, specifically Star Trek, if not directly took from, was certainly inspired by. The ship on Forbidden Planet, it almost looks like the saucer section of the Enterprise without the rest of it. These disks they stand on, it looks just like the transporter. It definitely looks like the designers of Star Trek looked at this and said, boy, this is a beautiful looking movie. Forbidden Planet is definitely less diverse, which makes uh, Star Trek special. Space, the final frontier. Well, the importance of Star Trek is that it brought space into the living rooms of Americans and people really across the globe. It made space accessible. Star Trek was a classic humanistic vision of the kind of utopian future that you li live and let live. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Gene Roddenberry said he wanted to do an all-inclusive series in space with all the ideas that could more easily be done in science fiction in the 60s than in realistic fiction. To boldly go where no man has gone before. So you could deal with controversial issues, but they weren't controversial because they're distanced. They're not us. It's not our own society. We did want to get into racial issues, sexist issues that were going on at the time. And I think it opened a door into an alien world that people could say, oh, yeah, I get that. It offered lots of story opportunities to tell stories about things going on right here on Earth. <laughs> this is no game, Captain. Half a million people have just been killed. There's an episode called uh, A Taste of Armageddon about these two planets that have that are conducting a virtual war. Computers, Captain. They fight their war with computers, totally. Computers don't kill a half a million people. Deaths have been registered. Of course, they have 24 hours to report. To report. To our disintegration machines. At the very end of it, Kirk says, We're human beings with the blood of a million savage years on our hands. But we can stop it. We can admit that we're killers, but we're not going to kill today. So all of these different stories, they all had a social message buried in them. Gene knew what he was doing. The writers knew what they were doing. It's up to you. Star Trek was a way of saying, look, we can do better. Things the way they are, it's not necessarily the way they have to be. What about the cast of the show? I'm told that NBC only wanted white males on the bridge, no women, no blacks. When I brought in a mixed racial crew, both the network and Desilu Studios, which had it at that time, came in saying, uh, what are you doing? You're going to ruin us. I can tell you what happened to me the first time I saw Star Trek. Really, before Star Trek, there were no people of color in the future. We didn't really exist at all anywhere. And Gene Roddenberry created this group where this beautiful black woman, not a mammy, was head of communications. Captain, I'm picking up a subspace distress call. Priority channel, it's from space station K7. So to see her in that position, for me, was like extraordinary. And it's why I went to Gene to do Star Trek Next Generation was because of what Michelle Nichols showed me, which was that I had a future in the world. What about you? You speak Romulan or Cadet? Uhura, all three dialects, sir. The day that I met Michelle Nichols, I was very nervous because that was the first time for me to step in someone else's shoes. And she suspended any kind of judgment, if anything. She handed me that torch and she said, run with it. The jamming signal's gone. Transportability are re-established. The main attribute that Star Trek gives people is hope. May we together become greater than the sum of both of us. What I took from the original series was the love humanity is able to have. Even if it's set in a time that they may never recognize, they may never meet, the strive for that is tangible. Live long and prosper, Spock. Live long and prosper. The cultural importance of the Star Trek franchise can't be underestimated. We've had to date seven different series, 13 films, and hundreds of novelizations, comic books, board games, video games, costumes. Fans love Star Trek because it does suggest that there would be opportunities for us to meet each other in space and to learn from each other. The most powerful message to me of Star Trek was just the idea that by 
Stepping out into the universe, we put our old problems behind us and we become better people through cooperation and, you know, believing in a certain set of values. <laughs> it's a very romantic notion. It's a very idealistic notion, but that's a universe I want to go live in. I want to go get on a starship. I want to be part of the Federation. 2001, as far as I'm concerned, is the best science fiction film ever made. It is the quintessential what space travel is. Yeah. And it looks great. You know, it's, 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 it's just, it's impeccable the way they put it together. The discovery coming overhead endlessly is basically right. the precursor of the, of the opening shot of Star Wars. It right. stunned everybody, myself included. Probably 2001 had more of an influence on me than I realized. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was completely stoked by that movie. It's brilliant. I think 2001 opened up films to be a much broader and interesting canvas in terms of what space travel might be like than anything had been shown before. Everything was believable, even though it would have our jaws on our laps at amazement. But everything always had a reality to it. That's absolutely the most meticulously accurate science fiction movie between Arthur C. Clarke, the hard science fiction writer, and Stanley Kubrick, the visionary filmmaker, who thought this image is all you need. Let the audience figure it out. In that sense, everything was a surprise and a visual entree of unbelievable significance. But it's really not the, the filmmaking part of it, it's the let's go into outer space that part too. of it. That and too. And we have the reality now to deal with it, which is why Mars is becoming more of a thing. But we have to get people to say, this is a fun adventure. I guess I was probably 11 years old when I, when I first saw Star Wars. It was the most magnificent experience I had ever had in my life. My, my mind was, you know, you're searching for those answers and the world and you're hungry. And I looked at Star Wars and I, just, I knew I wanted to live in that world. I've been chasing Star Wars for my entire career. Star Wars is a landmark film in the history of science fiction stories about space because it opened up the excitement and the adventure of traveling from planet to planet and made us all want to go there with the heroes. Take five, five, nine, take two. Action. We built the cameras, we built the optical printers, we built the miniatures all under one roof, which was kind of unusual. We could fabricate metal, we could do machining did chemistry for the explosions. There was a whole litany of things that were new. The first shot in the movie was sort of the touchstone for whether it was going to work or not. It had a miniature of the Star Destroyer, which was three feet long. When we saw it, everybody went, wow, it's great. That is a shot of pure awe where suddenly, as a viewer, you are just knocked out by the potential of space and where this movie could go. This was revolutionary. Really felt like you were standing there and the ship was coming overhead. It was so transformative. Talk about what your influences were that fed into the creation of Star Wars. As much as Star Wars seemed to just leap from your forehead, no. fully formed, it had roots that any, nothing, anybody in the science nothing, fiction world knows. Nothing in this world pops into your head fully formed. It's an accumulation of all the things you've seen, and then when you go to regurgitate it into a, your own thing, you take all the best parts. The roll-up, that was taken from Flash Gordon the angle that it rolls up the screen, with the way the text was arranged, even the number of ellipses. And he was very much influenced by the movies of Akira Kurosawa. Yeah. So in terms of cowboy films, Lucas was very influenced by John Ford's The Searchers which contains a scene that very much mirrors the scene where Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru uh, are, are murdered. Murder! Murder! Uncle Owen! 
Admiral! That definitely helped fuel this notion that Star Wars is a space western. One of the things that was really critical in Star Wars was, again, this sense of adrenaline and the idea of uh, trajectory in the space. Almost there. And that brought some of that visceral quality back to it, sort of the idea of having that rush. I can't shake it. And you know, it's interesting. The closer you get to something at speed, the faster it feels. It's just like Beggar's Canyon back home. So that was really the idea behind the trench for the Death Star. Let's get people down into a space that's traveling at an extreme speed and give you the excitement that you get when you go to real. I mean, there's so many great shots in Star Wars, but I think if there's one that makes my heart ache a bit, it's Luke seeing the two suns set. It just has this very somewhere over the rainbow kind of wistful vibe to it. That is a shot that I can relate to as a teenager in Texas. <laughs> that is a shot that I think any kid can relate to, this idea of what is next for me and how do I go? There's this yearning that makes this space story feel like something that's happening to us. One of the reasons why I made Star Wars is it's made for 12-year-olds. It appeals to everybody, but it was still made for 12-year-olds. We and, were all 12 and, once. And I tell people, don't underestimate 12-year-olds. They're smarter than the rest of us. Right. They get stuff much faster than you do. Yeah. And the whole point was to get them to allow to think, allow them to think outside the box. And the yeah. whole thing is subjective and dreamy. Yeah. Who said Wookiees can't fly? Well, I said they can fly. Yeah. I said, I'm not going to obey the rules. If you can imagine it, you can do it. But if you can't imagine it, you can't do it. Yeah. Because it's the prison of your own mind, again. It's that prison of your own mind that allows you to do it. And you can enjoy that and come up with really crazy stuff. Yeah, to say, Chewbacca. Well, I can guarantee there's no Wookiees in space. How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> you single-handedly revolutionized science fiction and pop culture with Star Wars in 1977. Because it had been three decades of downer stuff dystopian stuff, apocalyptic stuff, and science fiction was making less and less and less money every year, and then all of a sudden you came along with another vision, one of wonder and hope and empowerment, and boom. Star Wars is a space opera. It's not science fiction. And it's because it's really just, you know, one of those soap operas only in space. Yeah, but, but it's more than that. Yeah. And, and you know, and you know right, it right. is. It's, it's a neo-myth. But it's, it yeah, fulfills well, it's, the it's, role that myth played yeah, in it society. Is, it's mythology. But you took it to a new level. No film that I can think of had the used future idea. The future was always shiny. It was always perfect. It always had just been unwrapped on Christmas morning because it was this kind of optimistic ideal. And you said, no, the future has to have been lived in for thousands of years. So the sand crawlers all rusted and things are kind of broken and it looked like it had been lived in. So where did that idea come from? Because there was no precursor to that. I just felt that it's got to look like it's the real place. The transition from the science fiction space travel of the 60s to the 70s, it probably reflects a wider shift in culture at that time. The sort of general cynicism of the 70s has kind of infected this vision of the future. And it's like, OK, if we get into outer space, probably giant corporations are still going to be running everything. And that's when you get to movies like Alien. Where you have a spacecraft that looks like it's been through the mill. Things are leaking. Steam sprouting out of broken pipes. It's grimy. And the place is a mess. Look, I'm not going to do any more work. We get this straightened out. Brett. You're guaranteed by law to get a share. And it's, I think, no accident that in a lot of these films, it's the military industrial complex that are the real monster in space. This could cause trouble for us and all the other mining operations. That could put my people out of business. Don't worry. He's a dead man. From the moment that humans set off to lands that they'd never been to before, immediately what follows that is you see all of the normal human problems that we have in societies transposed to other worlds. Which means you're going to have labor problems. You're going to have hazardous environments for workers. You're going to have all kinds of things that reflect what might be the reality of outer space exploration. 
At some point, corporations are going to have to get involved. At some point, maybe the government will have to take over and lead to something like a militarized society like the Starship Troopers. We break net now and take you live to Clendathil, where the invasion has begun. It's an ugly planet! A fun planet! When Paul Verhoeven and I were talking one day, what movies would we like to make? He said, well, I, I've always wanted to do a movie about like what it was like to be you know, 15 years old in Nazi Germany in 1935, when nobody knew it was bad yet. It's just a pretty interesting idea. It came to me, the idea, based on being a young boy when I was occupied by the Germans, of course, in, in Holland, which was fascist, clearly, or Nazis, whatever you want to call it. I said, I remember saying to him, well, they won't let us do that. But then I thought, oh, Starship Troopers, we can do that. Based on the book by Robert Heinlein, really is a kind of a political tract and fairly conservative political tract where he said if people who had been in the military ran the world, it would be fair and right. He really felt that the kind of mentality that was encouraged in the US Army was extremely important for making boys into men. Starship Troopers is an important science fiction movie because it's one of the few movies that warns us that humans may bring the worst of themselves into space rather than the best of themselves. We really tried to bring in a level of criticism about what these people are doing, especially in the newsreels, continuously telling to the audience, you like these people, these are your heroes and heroines. By the way, they're probably fascist. And what's fascinating about these patriotic newsreels, they are very shot for shot similar to Triumph of the Will. this galaxy now and always. The movie I wanted to do was a movie about war and propaganda and why we go to war and what happens to us when we do. But I wanted to tell it, you know, almost like a 1950s B movie. Starship Troopers is Troy Donahue and Sandra D go to outer space, fight giant bugs and become Nazis was my kind of log line. Kill them! Kill them all! The story of humankind is exploration is followed by colonialization and exploitation. So we've always done this. He figured that he could get an alien back through quarantine if one of us was impregnated. I don't know which species is worse. You don't see them each other over for a damn percentage. And I think what you see in science fiction is as we reach out into the universe, we take all of our baggage with us. My parents thought the television, and this is back in the early 50s, yeah. was the worst influence. So they prevented me from watching television. I could only watch like Jackie Gleason, The Honeymooners. Yeah, right. And so I started to imagine my own shows. If I couldn't watch television, I would just dream up something for myself to yeah. enjoy. And that's what kids do when they're exercising their natural ability to create worlds that don't exist. I mean, I remember when I saw Mysterious Island uh, in, in the third grade, I raced home and started doing my own version of Mysterious Island. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's the creative impulse. You take it in. You, I don't want to copy it in a slavish fan way. I want to yes. create my own version. It, was, it, it always had to do with a pencil and a piece of paper and, of course, later the 8 millimeter movie camera. But you were processing the world back out in the form of something visual. Exactly. That, 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 that's, that's a blast, because you know you, you do the same thing. When I sit down to storyboard, I come up with my best ideas in the process of making my sketches. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideas that weren't even in the script and weren't even in my imagination right. will come out as I'm actually drawing. The uh, science fiction artists are often overlooked in the history of science fiction. But artists have influenced authors in their own right because they, you know, they're bringing their ideas and characters to life visually. But if you think back to everything you probably visualize about science fiction, you're probably going back to what a science fiction artist has done.
Chesley Bonestell is considered the father of space art or astronomic art. He started producing in the 1940s these paintings that were extraordinarily realistic. You'll find even today uh, astronomers, astronauts, astrophysicists, engineers who will say that you know they got into doing what they're doing because as kids they were inspired by Chesley Bonestell. The great advantage of science fiction is that you can draw anything on this vast canvas of space. It's all open, you know, for you to throw your imagination in. With world building, you are creating a society from scratch, a planet from scratch, a people from scratch. They may not look like people like you and me, but they are people. Every plant that you see in that remarkable forest on Pandora even if you see it for a half a second, has an English name, a Latin name, a Navi name, and probably a two-page description on its ecology, on how it reproduces, and how it's used by the Navi. So if you're gonna go into that much detail, then you're not gonna skimp on the language. Can I make it? You've got to make sure that everything really holds together. And the language I wrote it, it's like 400 words. And I make a little dictionary. And that was interesting because the only two person who can speak the language at the time was, was Mila and me. We were kind of fluent after a couple of weeks. What is your name? That's her name. <laughs> I think there's like a first, middle, and last somewhere in there. <laughs> Don't ask me which. <laughs> Working with Luc Besson, who wrote and directed Fifth Element, it changed my life. It just seemed so realistic to me, which I was really impressed by. It's the, the white page that you can write everything. You can make everything beautiful again in space. I like the fantasy of it. And I just take a subject like the law, uh, the police, the food. Good fortune for you. And then I start writing, you know, 10, 15 pages on each. Uh, and then you give that to the actors, and, and it gives some life and polish on, on the story, even if you never talk about it. Science fiction is probably the best way to open your mind about everything. And sci-fi is just an oil, so the doors open easier. It doesn't like <laughs> so hard to push. Space is the biggest canvas to write whatever you want to push all the limits, because by definition, future doesn't have a limit. Or if there is one, we don't know it. <laughs> when I was eight or nine years old, I was obsessed with creating different planets, creating these worlds and these universes and, and building them up from the ground, even at that young age and I wrote up the visuals of Guardians of the Galaxy. Hundreds of pages of documents with the different cultures and what they do and how do they think. Where you're creating a world in outer space based on real rules that is still filled with imagination and fantasy. Oh, yeah. When you're dealing with a raccoon in a tree, you are in some ways dealing with space fantasy. But within that, let's say there is a talking raccoon. What would it be and how would it be? And I came up with Rocket Raccoon is a result of experiments on his body to turn him into something that's designed to kill. Ain't no thing like me except me. I'm Groot. Yeah, you said that. Groot's the most popular character from Guardians of the Galaxy. He's probably the soul of the movie. I mean, I remember like it was yesterday, we were getting ready to shoot this scene where Groot grows into sort of like this nest and protects us from this impact that was just going to completely kill us. That day when we were shooting that scene that we couldn't stop crying. This character that doesn't even exist, but risking his life for mine was very moving. Why are you doing this? It's very much of a, a Christ story. We have this character who gives his life and is born again. We are Groot. 
We Are Groot is the line of dialogue that every single other thing in the movie is hanging on. It's about seeing a raccoon and a human being and a green assassin and a big oaf, and they find a family with each other for the first time, an outer space family. That's what makes it science fiction, is that it's an outer space family. Today it is you who learn the power of Mars. Tomorrow it will be the whole world. We're dreaming. Is it about Mars? The angry red planet. We're heading straight for Mars. Ooh, Mars is burning up. Good God, I'm on Mars. 50 years ago, space is an extraordinarily hostile environment. And then we go through the trajectory of science fiction, which includes exploring the rest of the universe. But the solar system is now very much within our reach. The closest Mars ever gets to us is 36 million miles, which doesn't seem so huge when you think about light years. It's a tiny distance by comparison. Stories like The Martian make us believe that we can and will do this in our own lifetime. I gotta figure out a way to grow three years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. In The Martian, what you see is a smart person actually acting smart, using his brain to solve problems instead of a lightsaber or a ray gun. They say that once you grow crops somewhere, you've officially colonized it. So, technically, I colonized Mars. One of the other great things that Andy Weir's The Martian does is make the experience seem like an everyday experience, almost. You can see yourself as Mark Watney. He doesn't power through problems without hitting a hitch. He hits every single hitch there is. <laughs> and you get to see him work through them. And you find yourself thinking, I could do that. So it's inspirational, but it's also just very practical. I forgot to account for the excess oxygen that I've been exhaling when I did my calculations because I'm stupid. The whole story is just one prolonged cascade failure. Basically, his solution to this immediate problem leads to the next problem and the next and the next and so on. I would say that the problem-solving style of Arthur Clarke and also Robert Heinlein influenced how I wrote The Martian. Although, uh, I would say one of the biggest influences on The Martian was Apollo 13, both the real events and the movie. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. My father is a particle physicist, and my mother is an electrical engineer. So I was pretty much doomed to be a nerd. There is one joke where they tell him everything he's typing is being broadcast live to the entire world. Yeah? In the novel, he says, look, a pair of boobs, and draws like these ASCII art boobs. It's open parenthesis, period, Y, period, close parenthesis. They didn't put that in the movie. They just had everybody look up and go, oh. Oh, my God. As if he'd written something really profane. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the out of this. I'm gonna have to science the out of this. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean to you? Well, it equates with his thrill of terror, saying, I'm either gonna die here or I can survive. Yeah. And so he leans heavily on what I call gallows humor. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna think too much about this. I'm gonna take it day by day, hour by hour. Yeah. And I'm gonna have to science the out of this to get my survival going. That kind of yeah. humor yeah. probably keeps in check terror and fear, which will right. stop him functioning. Right. You know what I got out of it? We're all that guy. Our, oh. The, our state right now of affairs on Earth yeah. is such that we have no choice but to science the shit out of it Correct. in order to survive. That's good The threats in front of us yes. are threats that will be solved, that are, they're caused by technology for the most part, and they need to be solved by science. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the drive for the realism of The Martian is the fact that we will get to Mars quite soon. So suddenly it's come right back to our doorstep, that we now have the technology and are building the sophisticated means for getting to Mars and colonizing Mars. That's why The Martian is, is important and why it has that realism to it. This is space. It does not cooperate. At some point, everything's gonna go south and you're gonna say, this is it. 
Now you can either accept that or you can get to work. If we don't figure out how to get to Mars and live there and then build another spaceship that can go to another solar system, yeah. we're toast. Yeah, in the, in the long term way. And, and to say, yeah, we've only got a million years to figure this out. We better, we're way behind schedule here. <laughs> so you have to get people to sort of buy into the idea. And if we didn't have these movies yeah. to say, this is an adventure, this is really going to be fun. Yeah. Do you think we'd be dumb enough to go in a spaceship off to Mars where there's nothing there but a bunch of red dirt? Yeah. No, it's like the adventure, the whole idea of it. We have to do this. The human race depends on it. Well, thank you for doing this. My pleasure. This has been an amazing brain jam. Yeah, well, this is all I have to do now. <laughs> and I don't get to do it very much. <laughs>